problems of Uganda are much deeper. We can change the next 20 presidents and we'll still be this roundabout. Deeply incisive. The different political forces that, that we have in the country, in the, in the country, we, we don't seem to really have achieved that, you know, minimum political consensus over certain things. Authentically symbolic and insightful. Behind the headlines every Wednesday at 10 p.m. with Charles Sodong To. All on your public broadcaster, UBC. Inspiring Uganda. This week on UBC. UBC, the program that helps you identify opportunities for investment, job creation, growing your entrepreneurial skills, wealth creation, and social transformation. We have a product that is ready for schools, uh, supermarkets. Create wealth, transform livelihoods. Every week we showcase opportunities for creating new products and enterprises. I now harvest a lot of cocoa. When I harvest it, I sell. After selling, I, I put money in my project. I have two projects. One is for construction of my house. Two is for educating my children. Excellence in innovation, the passion and drive to succeed, and the right mindset to grow your business. Lives transformed on UBC. Every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Create wealth, transform livelihoods. Brought to you by Operation Wealth Creation. Uganda's economy has grown tremendously with a 34 billion US dollars GDP currently compared to 3.923 billion US dollars GDP back then in 1986. This has been possible due to the overwhelming government support towards the investment sector. Due to the largely growing domestic market of nearly 45 million people strategically located in the heart of Africa with a combined market population of over 700 million in the East African community and commercial region. The Investor is a program that will showcase the different investments that have boosted the economic transformation of this great country. The investment climate in Uganda is something that we have found very, very encouraging. We are here to continue to support and build Uganda from its core. If you want to make money through investing in Uganda and beyond, this is the program on UBC that you must not miss the investor let's talk business coming soon on ubc tv inspiring uganda bori munya uganda naitinga makuru marunji ubc west ina makuru marunji kandi agari kwesigwa rero za program za yuziri omuri nyakitara hamwe nurufumbira UBC West, in a technology, a young lady, a Rukujavasa, Quika, Omuichueka, Yona, Omuihanga, Nangu, Nahiri Hang. To quarter our frequencies, eh? Chisoro, Chenanam Shanju, Katunism Shanju, Farmer. Kalari, Chenanisha to Katunism Shanju, Farmer. Hoima, Chenanamu in the Katunism, Farmer. Kampala, Iganita no Katunism Shanju, Farmer. Mbarara, Chenanam Shanju, Katunizina, Farmer. Footpoto, Chenanam Nana Katunism Nana, Farmer. Masindi, Iganita no Farmer. Purchase the UBC West, or who didn't Baganiza? UBC West, and Pikahuna.
Good evening, our dear viewer. Thank you so much uh, for staying with us and uh, watching the national broadcaster UBC inspiring Uganda out there. Coming to you live uh, from Broadcast House Nile Avenue, uh, right here in town. My name is Sandra, and today is a special talk show that we bring to you. And uh, we're going to be talking about a vulnerable issues are quite emotional right here i'm sure you'll understand with time but gone are the days uh, when we discriminate and isolate ourselves when it comes to certain issues or challenges that you go that you go through as a person we all went through quite a lot uh, during the pandemic the past two years uh, it really challenged most of us and, that, and affected all age brackets what we're going to discuss tonight concerns partly that are the discrimination that we did experience in the past two years when you live with some or you're living with disability and a lot to do with that. Our talk of discussion today, we're going to look at stigmatization and uh, discrimination that is to do with uh, ending HIV stigma and uh, discrimination in our societies. This is a collective responsibility. Uh, you and I are supposed to uh, work together hand in hand uh, to end this particular vice. Now looking at a country in general, uh, Uganda. Well, Uganda, I would say it has, it has really played a significant process when it comes to uh, fighting uh, HIV and AIDS. Uh, you, you will agree with me The certain policies have been put in place uh, by government and uh, we're starting now this journey. I know it started years ago but this very year 2022 now that we're all able and out to work in regards to the to the hard times that we suffered the past two years we're out and about you're ready to move on stand on our feet by God's grace. Uh, all sectors are, rec are slowly recovering and uh, this particular sector as well is also re re slowly recovering. That is to do with Ministry of Health. And uh, to help me discuss that and much more for this particular topic, I'm having with me in studio a great man, very passionate at what he does. That is the Executive Director of UYP. In full, it is Uganda Young Positives. Uh, he handles such matters, all age brackets and all different sexes in all the regions of Uganda. He'll be telling us that and much more this long journey they have walked and getting to this particular point in ending stigma and discrimination amongst Ugandans. You're most welcome, Krish Amoviru. Thank you very much. The Executive Sandra. Director of UYP. It's good to have your company right here at UBC. It's a pleasure being here and thank you very much to the management and uh, staff of UBC who have hosted me tonight to talk about issues that you know affect the common man. As you rightly mentioned, my name is Krish Moviru. I'm the executive director of Uganda Young Positives, an organization that coordinates young people living with HIV mainly those from the informal sector for action in scaling up prevention, care and support services. We operate throughout the country, but our main secretariat is in Mengo, Kampala. Uh, I also represent persons living with HIV, those are communities and uh, civil society, on the country coordinating mechanism for the Global Fund in Uganda. Mm -hmm. So it's a pleasure being here and I'm glad impact on the lives of Ugandans. You know, you're quite passionate at what you do. Um, I, I, I had lots of words to say out there to introduce you to the viewers watching us tonight. Uh, you, you represent UIP and uh, uh, CCM. You know, there's really, uh, I understand government has been in support with what you're putting forward to the Ugandans, but I understand there are other organizations that you're working together with. Can you like tell us more? You are a team leader when it comes to you. Yeah, at UYP. Uganda Young Positives, I'm so a team really leader. There. An umbrella body, you work with TESO, yeah. so maybe just letting the viewer know what it is all about. Yeah, so uh, the CCM board is, is basically a mechanism. CCM in full is the country coordinating mechanism for the Global Fund. In the HIV arena, we have quite a number of partners, AIDS development partners that are supporting Uganda in the fight against this epidemic and one of them is the Global Fund. So the Global Fund has a board in Uganda that oversees its resources, uh, program implementation and program oversight. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is that board uh, where I sit with several other colleagues uh, to discuss such issues. Now when resources for the Global Fund come in Uganda, uh, we have mechanisms through which these resources operate. 
The first mechanism is uh, through the government directly, government to government support, and that one we call it the principal recipient number one, who is the Minister of Finance, and it goes ahead to work with several other ministries like Minister of Health, Minister of Education, Minister of Gender, and so on and so forth to mitigate, you know, interventions that are directly run by the government for and on behalf of the people. Now the other mechanism through which resources for the Global Fund and program implementation is done is through principal recipient number two. Now principal recipient two is TASO. TASO is known to most Ugandans, it's the aid support organization. It is the one that receives resources for and on behalf of civil society organizations and entities that do not necessarily you know, operate through the mainstream government business. Now, when DASO receives such resources, it also goes out ahead to sub-grant mm -hmm. several other organizations, including, uh, but not limited, to organizations like Huganet, uh, here of ICW, several other organizations. Now that one we call it uh, the stream of PR2. It is from that stream of PR2 that organizations like Huganet and Uganda Young Positives come to the forefront to, you know, push issues like uh, the talk show that we are having tonight, mm -hmm. advocacy issues that impact on the last man on the ground. So basically that is how the Global Fund works. Mm -hmm. And today we are pertinently here to use these program resources, but also you know, discuss issues that we feel are pertinent mm -hmm. to the common man. The issue of stigma and discrimination. Speaking is, about the journey, I just is, get in. Is very, when very, did you very start pertinent. this particular journey or this particular work of um, Living with um, dealing with people who are positive? Uh, the journey began quite uh, a, a some, some time back before most of us were born. Um, I'm a young man nearly in my early 30s, 30s and uh, colleagues that were there before me started way back before I, I was even born. The Uganda AIDS Commission, per se, has been in existence for more than 30 years now. Uh, TASO, that has you know, given us this opportunity to appear on TV, has been here for more than 30 years. Uh, colleagues from UGANET, colleagues from other organizations Specifically have, have, have worked this young journey positives. For, How old for is a it? very long time. Uganda Young Positives has been in existence for more than 15 years. Wow. My predecessors uh, did a commendable work and I joined the organization around eight years ago as, as a community volunteer and I had to go through the ranks and now I am the I executive I imagine it director. has been tough all through. Yeah, of, <laughs> of the organization. But it, it has impacted so many lives of young people, especially those living with HIV, to the extent that now uh, we have a membership of more than 60,000 mm -hmm. uh, young positives that subscribe to our organization. We have representation in, in different regions of the country. We hold several you know, activities that reach uh, the last young person that we intend to. So it has not been a, an easy journey. Mm -hmm. I told you most of us came in, in this arena uh, following the passion that we had, but also our experiences as, as young people. And you know, some people would wake up uh, when, when, we, when we get to the 12th month, when it is December, that's when they tend to remember uh, such issues or topics uh, to do with HIV and yeah. AIDS. Um, you starting now the journey, by the time we get to December, I'm sure you'll have registered you know, certain achievements. Yeah, that, that, that has been our outcry over the years that we are not supposed to reflect on issues of HIV on 1st December every year. Whereas 1st December has been earmarked as the International Day of you know, AIDS where, where we commemorate World AIDS Day. It is not per se the only day where we need to reflect on such issues. HIV works with us on a daily People that are living with HIV 
a part of society. We work with them, we eat with them, we dine with them, we marry them, we go to school with them. And therefore, HIV should be a daily discussion in, in most of the things that we do. So maybe, maybe um, in your kind of research that you've done, yeah. uh, since you've been dealing uh, with this particular topic, can you briefly uh, tell us um, the situation, how it is, HIV and AIDS, the situation briefly in Uganda as a whole? As we speak right about now, according to the Uganda population, HIV population impact assessment, OFIA report that uh, was launched by our government through the Ministry of Health in February this year, uh, about 1.4 million Ugandans are living with HIV, mm -hmm. and the prevalence is about 5.5%. Now, when I talk about 5.5%, it means that out of every 100 Ugandans you meet out there, at least five of them are living with HIV. Now, that's, that's a remarkable statistic because it brings us from afar, where we used to have about 6.7, you know, percent prevalence rate. We have walked a milestone, but the struggle is not yet finished. Whereas the general picture is at 5%, we have specific subpopulations that are still struggling. For example, women, the preference for women stands at 7.1. Now that's a high number. The preference for adolescent girls and young women, it is also high. The preference for s certain subpopulation is still high. The other shocking statistic that we have now is that whereas women are greatly affected, the prevalence is higher in, in women and girls, but when it comes to their male counterparts, because of their health-seeking behavior, more men are actually dying of, of HIV. The prevalence is low in men, but the death rates the rate at which HIV is actually killing men is higher than that one of men, I mean that one of women. of women. And therefore it is a point of concern for us. That is the general picture of, of the country as we speak now and for us we are glad that uh, the UNAIDS, that is the international body that coordinates and mitigates HIV for and on behalf of the United Nations, uh, in 2001 came up with a new strategy and this strategy is basically fighting inequalities. It's focused on ending inequalities in the HIV arena but also putting communities at the center stage in this response. It is from this strategy that we drive interventions like this of fighting stigma and discrimination. Uh, last month, this month in in, in, the month that in we're May, ending today. The, the month that we are ending, ending today, tonight, tonight yes. uh, on the 15th mm -hmm. of this month, we had a candlelight uh, memorial celebration. Mm -hmm. It took part in Bukedia a district. Now that celebration is normally ha uh, held in, in May every year. And in this year's commemoration, we were basically uh, deriving from the stigma point of view, telling people that stigma and discrimination, if we are to end it, ending stigma and discrimination is our collective responsibility. Now the UNAID strategy is trying to fight inequalities that promote stigma and discrimination. Among and the people. Yes, and stigma and discrimination is a silent killer. Mm. You might have a disease, but it's one thing to have a disease and to die from that disease. So that cuts across. Yes. When it comes to both sexes, it yes. cuts across the stigma and, and discrimination, discrimination. As, as in regards to your research. Exactly. And that points out why more men are dying than women. The percentage because of the men. I, I, I want for someone to really understand yes. that. You know, because uh, um, you look at a man, 
Mm -hmm. Usually it represents yeah. masculinity exactly. and the superiority. Yes. One would think they're strong enough. Uh -huh. And then the women always lean on the men for that kind of strength or stability in life. I want, I want you to let the person know as regarding to your findings, mm -hmm. how come the men at the end of the day? Mm. Is it because the women are having the strong will or because they really have to stand out uh, to stay alive? And maybe looking at those children, I need to stay and live for my children. What are your findings all about? No. And uh, gone are the days uh, when it used to be like uh, the male counterpart and the female, you know? Maybe that is where the infection would come from. But nowadays, you would have cases of the same sex. Yeah. I want, us to, I want you to make the viewer understand in regards to such findings. Yeah, our findings are showing us that more men are dying due to AIDS-related uh, cases than women because of what you have rightly mentioned uh, Sandra our viewers should understand that because stigma is is manifested in, in, in our society uh, men because of our masculinity uh, setting and the patriarchy within the African uh, tradition society men do not have that sense of vulnerability in them and diseases like HIV are, are taken to be vulnerable diseases. Diseases for the vulnerable. You know, diseases for the poor, diseases for the weak. And that kind of mindset derives men from seeking care. That kind of mindset will let men die in silence without accepting that they actually need help. And therefore, when we speak about stigma and discrimination, later in the discussion, I will take our viewers through the different forms of stigma and discrimination. But be because of such things, if we don't mitigate them, if there is no direct intervention that brings men out of that corner, statistics will not be much different in the years to come, just like they have not been much different this year. Statistics are telling us that more men are dying because of HIV, whereas more women are contracting HIV. The answer is simple. Our findings are telling us that men do not seek care and treatment. Why? Because of stigma and discrimination. How can Christ enter into a facility? to mm. go and pick air of We are saying Mr. Mbiru go to the health facility. Yes. Or is it because um, they, ten they usually say that um, it's a men thing? They don't, you don't like taking tablets? You don't like to go for checkup, even if it's antenental? You, f you, you, you go ahead and give your wife a push, your partner a push? Yes. Now, what promotes that kind of mindset? The stigma and discrimination behind it is, is the one that promotes that that, that, that set up. Because when a man enters into a health facility, his other fellow men, who are not as brave as he is, they will tell him at the end of the day when he has come back, mm -hmm. that who told you to go in those women things? Mm -hmm. You know? Now such a statement is so stigmatizing, is so discriminating, it, is, it promotes inequality, mm -hmm. gender inequality, and therefore, to a man who is not as strong as Christ, to a man who is not as strong as other men in, in, in the response, will not go back the second time. He will say, okay, if me going to the health facility makes me weaker, mm -hmm. then let me stay at home. With the people that you have, that you're embracing, yeah. that are part of the organizations, or those that subscribe uh, to, to your assistance, or to your support, or advise um, things relatedly to that, um, tell us, have, you, have you had cases to do with same sex? Yeah, we operate in a world of uh, different gender uh, diversities. We have to believe as Ugandans that we are different in our settings. And we have colleagues that uh, interact with same sex uh, in terms of you know, uh, sexual orientation and all that. And uh, as the Ministry of Health and as Government of Uganda, we have been at the center 
of uh, reaching out to these specific subpopulations. And even the UFIA report recognizes that in this specific subpopulation, the HIV preference is actually high. And before we know it, if we don't mitigate it, for example, with men that have sex with men, with uh, women that have sex with women, mm -hmm. with uh, transgender, in the transgender communities, we, we ought to lose the bigger picture, mm -hmm. the achievement, the goals that we have, you know, achieved in, in the 30 years, the 40 years journey of fighting HIV in Uganda. If we don't work with these specific subpopulations mm -hmm. to mitigate the prevalence they are in, we are losing the bigger picture. So for us as Uganda Young Positives and uh, all the other players in the HIV field, we recognize and appreciate uh, these specific subpopulations. We work with them. We have uh, the Uganda Key Population Consortium. It's a great partner that we work together on a daily basis. And it helps our beautiful government. It helps development partners. It helps colleagues you know, out there that are still in denial because of their sexual and gender orientation, that are still grappling with the disease burden. And at the end of the day, putting it on the bigger picture of the country to, to literally come out and we fight together. We work together to meet, get these challenges. So uh, just like you said, Sandra, it is true that we have colleagues in Uganda that interact with same sex. And in the HIV arena, because we are not promoters of discrimination, mm -hmm. we are not promoters of stigma, we cannot stand on, on any single occasion to say that we, we are not you know, together. In, in this Good. field, we are together, Good. we are working together, and we shall continue working together. It's good to know that you stand fight. out and embrace everyone, yes. um, regardless of where, what their beliefs are. Yeah. Uh, but as, as far as your advice or your support yeah. is concerned, that you reach out to them. If you've just joined us, uh, it's good to have you on board. It's UBC inspiring you. And we are live, uh, coming to you live from our broadcast house, Nile Avenue. My name is Sandra. And our guest for the day is the ED of UIP, that is Uganda y Young Positives. Uh, we're talking about HIV, uh, H ending HIV, AIDS, stigma, and uh, discrimination. Uh, not only waiting for 1st December, but we need to look at such issues that affect us in society. Our guest for the day is giving us a journey where they've started from in regards to this particular discussion. And they go far in various uh, regions of Uganda, uh, no, not discriminating anybody. I want um, Mobiru, the ED, to let us understand, to make the person out there who's watching, you telling us more in regarding to stigma a stigma and its impact on HIV and AIDS um, when it comes to the national response? Yeah, uh, stigma has always been the silent killer of people living with HIV next to uh, co-infections like tuberculosis. Tuberculosis kills, kills a lot of people living with HIV uh, in the world. But the next silent killer is stigma and discrimination. Whereas we don't have a scientific, uh, biometric, uh, pr proven intervention that can mitigate stigma or treat stigma, uh, we have the National Forum of People Living with HIV. And that forum helped us to conduct two stigma-indexed surveys. One was in 2013, and the other was in 2019. Now, these surveys were meant to measure, because our colleagues were telling us, how do we measure stigma? How do we quantify stigma? How do we know that so-and-so has been killed because of stigma? And you, you couldn't scientifically prove that. Now, it is this stigma index survey that came out and brought the reality to face, that look here, we have quite a number of people that are being stigmatized. We interacted with over 1,300 persons living with HIV. And out of them, at least 32% told us that they have been verbally 
assaulted. Mm -hmm. They have been physically assaulted because of HIV. A great number of them, about 22%, told us that they feel guilty of having HIV. Some of them say they don't feel comfortable going to the health facility to pick their medication because of stigma and discrimination. There is still a number of our own that are being discriminated and pushed away from families, social gatherings, and all that. In the school setting, it is worse. We have our own that we work together, and if you heard her story, you would break down. Why? Because one day she was at school, and the school matron, in front of all the other students, came and, you know, threw her medication down there. And she said, you, I'm not the one who infected you with HIV. Take these medications away, you know. That right. kind of thing. It still exists. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the stigma index survey helped us to quantify the levels of stigma. So how do you, how do you reach out to such a person, mm -hmm. for example, um, someone is positive, mm. they're living with a, with a disability, mm -hmm. or maybe they're positive and mm. um, they're young, they still want to have their life running, yeah. they want to either get married, mm. they're planning, they want to start a family, mm. uh, but they're uh, the, the, uh, because of the discrimination and stigmatization in particular society where they're staying at, mm. Everyone is talking about them, and they're like, how can you move up with such a person? How can you get such a lady when she's going through this? How do you reach out to them? How do you embrace them? Which kind of activities uh, do you put out for them? If someone had a story like that, mm. they're disabled, they're positive, mm. but they want to have a life. They mm. want to start up a family. How do you reach out to them? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. That, that, that's a brilliant question. Uh, but before I answer that question, I wanted to first finish up the story of the stigma With index the survey. Uh, survey. It, it, it also told us that uh, we have two kinds of stigma. We have the external and the internal stigma. Now, the, tr the 2019 survey told us that whereas the external stigma mm -hmm. has greatly reduced, the internal stigma that is within the population is actually higher. Colleagues don't feel comfortable opening up to their spouses, to their co-workers, to their employees that, is the that they are living. That is the internal. That is the internal. They don't feel comfortable within your family, others. within people who are closer yes. to you. And at the end of the day, they don't get support. Mm. Now, back to your question, how do we help people that have been stigmatized. Now, after these two great stigma index surveys, the one for 2013 and 2019, we had quite a number of interventions and recommendations. Mm -hmm. Now, part of our recommendation was to have the stigma policy in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Because we did have a legal framework that counter, counteracts you know, stigma. We so didn't have policy. any policy guidelines. So this policy has just been th implemented. That mitigate stigma. Mm. Uh, thanks to our development partners, we then got support. And through the Uganda AIDS Commission, we were able to develop the first ever, mm -hmm. in a space of 35 years, the first ever stigma policy guidelines of, to of, think of about 2020. It has just been implemented. Yes. So in 2020, Tough. This, it has really been yeah. a journey for you. In, in 2020, these stigma policy guidelines were developed and launched. Now this year, we went an extra mile of disseminating these guidelines to the districts. I was part of the team that went out in, in the different districts in Uganda to disseminate these guidelines. Now, part of what we do is to use such frameworks to empower our own. Mm -hmm. The framework is, is detailed, the guidelines are detailed, and they showcase what each and every party should do in the fight against stigma. What is the role of government? What is the role of civil society? What is the role of communities? What is the role of families? What is the role of you as an individual and who is judge. being stigmatized? Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of the way we empower our own. We let them know 
that first of all, you have guidelines that protect you. Mm -hmm. You have a legal framework that can support you when so and so stigmatizes you. When you face this kind of you know, uh, discrimination or stigmatization, this is where you should run you at. You should speak out. Now, that is one way. Mm -hmm. The other way is by sharing our own experiences as players. We have always had a slogan that nothing for us without us. And therefore, someone who has gone through the experience that you're going through, if he is at the forefront of counseling you and letting you know that this is not the end of the world, mm -hmm. is one other strategy that we use to support our own, the peer-to-peer -peer strategy. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, interventions like these ones. We use each and every platform to destigmatize the stigma that kills people. We let people understand through national television, through radio, through dialogues, through outreaches, that look here, no one at any point, not even you yourself, mm -hmm. you have the right to stigmatize yourself. And therefore, you, you shouldn't even attempt to think about it. And uh, the, the, these are the several, you know, unique strategies that we use to empower our own, on especially those that are stigmatized. On the lighter note, I wouldn't yeah. really manage, I wouldn't mm. handle your shoes. Yeah. It's quite <laughs> tough, uh, quite emotional. Yeah. How do you manage uh, to cope up with all those emotions going around? Uh, you know, it's quite vulnerable. Yeah. Now, we have uh, lived with this experience for, for quite a long time now, and uh, we, we, we have been shaped. You know, gold cannot be gold unless when it goes through fire. And some of us who have gone through this fire have now become, you know, hard rocks, and, you know, by, by, by the grace of God. Mm. We, 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 we don't get intimidated in one way or the other. We don't break out wh when we, fat, we face such things. You talked but about um, uh, sharing and reaching out to them, yes. uh, sharing your stories yeah. uh, to strengthen them, you know, as uh, you reach out to them. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. It's quite tough. Yeah. So, uh, I would, uh, before we get to the achievements, I know you could, be you could have registered in one way or the other success stories but i believe you still have a long way to go uh, you still have challenges going through now that at least you have the policy coming through which took quite some time mm. to be implemented what are some of those other challenges that these people share with you or what you go through as an organization yeah the other challenges is that uh, the, the forms of stigma uh, the, the external and internal we, we, when you combine them together, we get what we call manifestations of stigma. Mm -hmm. Where does stigma manifest? Stigma manifests in, in our communities. Where we live is where we live with stigma. Stigma manifests in our schools, mm -hmm. our learning institutions. Mm -hmm. We have lived with HIV for more than three decades now. But up to this point, some learners are not comfortable, and some teachers are not comfortable relating with learners or teachers who are HIV positive. Now, that's a shame. Yeah, very true. Stigma also manifests in our values, traditional, you know, cultural mm -hmm. values and, and beliefs. Because HIV seemingly is perceived to be an immoral disease. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. Whoever has HIV, the first perception, especially in our uh, culture and religious settings, the first perception is that these people are promiscuous. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, stigma manifests in that part of society at a very high rate. How can an imam be HIV positive? Mm -hmm. How can a Catholic priest be HIV positive? How can a daughter of a reverend be HIV positive? Now, that kind of manifestation, stigma manifestation, is still a big challenge for us. There is also what we call double stigma. 
Now, double stigma is a monster. You're living with HIV, you're also disabled. Now, that is double stigma. Mm -hmm. How did a disabled person get HIV? You're an adolescent girl or a young woman, you're living with HIV, but you want to access contraceptives. You want to go and, you know, be initiated on a family planning method. Going to the counter and you're thinking of buying uh, the, the condoms. Condom, you know, and someone knows that you're living with HIV, the health facility knows that you're living with HIV, and you're now opting for a contraception. They will tell you, hey, you want to kill the people's sons? You know? Uh, you're not supposed to have sex. You're living with HIV, the things are not yours. Have now, you even opened up to your partner? No, they will try to even get into no, that is the, the relationship. Stigma. No, that is double stigma. And double stigma is a big challenge. You, you, you're an old woman, you, you're above 50. Mm -hmm. Why do you need contraceptions? Why do you talk about things like this when you're actually living with HIV? Mm -hmm. Why don't you wait for your time to die? Now, that, th th those kind of talks, those kinds of, you know, finger-pointing uh, statements are the ones that we, we, we are still struggling with. And it's still a big challenge for us. No wonder we have not, you know, combated HIV. Well, uh, uh, just taking you back uh, for the past two years, mm. uh, that have not been easy for everyone, for all sectors, and mm. the Ministry of Health as well. They, used to, they, they were up and about, you know, on to their toes uh, when it came to the pandemic, uh, COVID-19. Uh, but at least, I would say uh, they did a commendable job. But uh, that does not mean that we never had other issues in society or other epidemics or other viruses. Uh, tell us about uh, the COVID-19 um, on HIV and AIDS. How was it like for you, for your organizations, and uh, for those people that you're reaching out to? Yeah. COVID-19, thank you very much for that question. COVID-19, just like any other sector in the world, it affected the national HIV response greatly. At the Global Fund CCM board where I sit, I remember we used to have meetings and meetings almost on the daily. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the organization Uganda Young Positives where I work, where my full-time responsibility is, I had to move out of my own comfort zone mm -hmm. to drive at least seven to eight to nine hours on a daily, trying to you know, reach out to colleagues that couldn't access their medication, especially in the lockdown days, and, and be able to deliver these life-saving communities. It wasn't an easy journey. In the COVID-19 era alone, remember, people were locked from, you know, from places where the lockdown found them. And therefore, at, at the first ever lockdown that we've ever had in the country, many of our colleagues remained stranded. They couldn't access medication, they couldn't access food. It was, it was a tough situation. I, I, I think of that situation every time I remember it and I just pray to God it never happens again in, in this part of the world. It was a tough situation. My phone here could, could ring a thousand times on a daily, getting calls left, right, center, telling me, Christ, we are at the edge of losing life. Christ, you need to do something for us. But thank God, uh, we stepped up with partners like UNAIDS, we stepped up with partners like TASO, with partners like Huguenet, and we were able to deliver some of you know, these uh, life-saving uh, medications, but also delivered some foodstuffs and uh, small, small packages that could sustain our own. It's unfortunate to report that during that period alone, the COVID uh, era, we lost quite a number of our colleagues, uh, several district coordinators and chairpersons succumbed to COVID, uh, some of our service providers, good doctors that used to treat us, that used to take good care of our own, you know, succumbed to COVID. So it was a tough situation. We thank God that 
the situation is getting lighter, mm -hmm. but the adverse effects of, of COVID-19, we are likely to live with them for the rest of our lives. And therefore for us, we, we want to draw lessons from, from that kind of arena. And as Uganda Young Positives, I'm glad to report to our viewers that we now have a regional partnership. We have a regional project called the UCAN project. UCAN stands for Young People's Collective Action Now. And that project is aiming at reducing stigma and discrimination, not only reducing stigma and discrimination, but also working around the globe to make sure that these adverse effects that we had in our subpopulation during and after the wake of COVID-19 are mitigated. Uh, but that situation was never easy. The COVID-19 situation was never easy. Yes, we, did. we, we saw gender-based violence mm -hmm. At its rising to the peak. Yes. We saw teenage pregnancies, especially in Musoga mm -hmm. sub-region and uh, uh, Teso sub-region, rising to the peak. We saw school dropouts. Quite a number of our own who were in school, mm -hmm. I'm afraid they didn't go back and they are not even thinking of going at back a tender age. Because, because life changed completely mm -hmm. after COVID-19. We have colleagues that uh, Uganda Young Positives in particular mm -hmm. focuses on, reaches out to. These are colleagues in the informal sector. For them, life will never be the same again because these are wanainchi that we are earning from a hand-to-mouth basis. The day they work is the day they eat. The day they go to the street to operate is the day they survive. If there is no any kind of movement, now, then definitely they will sleep on a hungry imagine stomach. Imagine the first 42 days of the lockdown, what was happening to these colleagues. But eventually, uh, we thank uh, the UNAIDS. It gave us some resources uh, through the Giving Hope Project, and we were able to revamp Life and, and reach on a out small scale. and reach out to all those people in the different regions. Yes, no, not all of them, mm -hmm. but on a small scale, we, we reached out to about 100, 100 uh, young positives in the informal sector to revamp uh, their businesses and also improve uh, their lives. It has been. It but was. It wasn't an easy. It was a tougher situation, yeah. and, and the viewer would also agree yeah. that uh, we shall forever live with those particular scars. Yes. But as far as Uganda is concerned, salute to His Excellency uh, for spearheading the fight and curbing that virus. Yeah. Um, any achievements along the way? I know it's a t tougher topic that we have for discussion, but I believe with the su success stories that are coming through, you could have registered achievements away from the policy being impl implemented. Yeah, we, we have some, some things to celebrate on. For example, Uganda is uh, one of the eight countries in the world that uh, managed to achieve the 1990 UN targets, 1990 mm -hmm. UN targets. When I speak about the 1990-90 UN targets, UN AIDS targets, uh, these were meant to ensure that 90% of all persons living with HIV in this part of the world know their HIV status mm -hmm. towards the first 90, knowing your HIV status. And 90% of those that are living with HIV being initiated on treatment and 90% of those that are on treatment registering viral road suppression. And we are glad to report that Uganda is one of the eight countries. The others include Swatini, Rwanda, and you know, several others that I don't have offered that registered success in, this, in that area. Now we have accelerated. The UNAIDS has accelerated to 95, 95. 95 targets. Mm -hmm. Previously, they were at 90, but now it is at 95. We can also celebrate that out of those 95, the first two 95s, the one for testing and initiating on treatment, mm -hmm. we are doing well. But uh, uh, the last 95 of viral rod suppression, we are not uh, doing as 
uh, as desired. What do you expect from government or maybe different stakeholders or the other organizations that you're partnering with? What do you expect from the community just in general? We expect that we should accelerate our advocacy. We should mitigate silent killers like uh, the killer of stigma and discrimination because it is this that prevents us from hitting our target. Remember our target is ending AIDS by 2030. And that target, we are literally left with eight years, less than eight years to hit that target. But we shall not hit the target when we still have you know, scars uh, that are, are brought by stigma and discrimination. Secondly, we need to improve on our resource envelope. We want to appreciate our AIDS development partners, uh, the Global Fund, PEPFA, USID, Irish Embassy. The AIDS and Commission. And, and so on and, and so, so on. Forth. Those colleagues are doing a great job for us in as far as you know, mitigating the HIV response is concerned. They do secure treatment for us. They do, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of things, but to us as a country, I think we need to pull up our socks in as far as domestic finance domestic financing is concerned. Uh, the other day, uh, last week on Tuesday, we had an engagement with uh, the Parliament of Uganda, particularly the HIV AIDS Committee, Parliamentary uh, Committee, and we reminded them of the AIDS Trust Fund. Now we have an Act of Parliament that was passed in 2014, that is the HIV Prevention and Control Act. And in that Act of Parliament, we actually you know, approved the AIDS Trust Fund. But up to date, this Trust Fund has not been operationalized. Mm -hmm. And it is that fund that is meant to look for and cater for the lives of Ugandans, especially those living with HIV in, in terms of domestic financing. Most of the resources that we are using, I should report to our viewers, the viewers of UBC, that 90%, over 90% of these resources come from aid, donations and grants. And we are afraid as players in this field that if this aid is washed away at a certain point, Uganda is likely to go back in, in the early 80s, in the early 90s, where we, we, we actually don't want to go. Well, before we let you go, is there anything you could have left us that you'd love to put across to the viewer? I want to appreciate Ugandans, especially young people uh, living with HIV, for taking a center role, for coming up broadly, to fight stigma and discrimination, but also to coming out broadly to let the world know that HIV does not define you. If you let HIV define you, if you let stigma define who you are, if you let discrimination define who you are, you're losing the battle. And to us as players, we want to win the battle together. The best way we can win the battle together is by fighting and ending stigma and discrimination because this is our collective responsibility. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure having your company and of course uh, the company of our viewer out there who has decided uh, to choose the national broadcaster to inspire you this very day, the last day of this month, 31st May 2022. Uh, you make us proud and we are proud of you each and every single time you tune in uh, to catch up with the latest uh, today our topic of discussion we've been looking at uh, ending HIV stigma and uh, discrimination which is our it is our collective responsibility uh, you and I joining forces and uh, reaching out to different people reach out to a person out there in your society in your family we've had quite a lot uh, as the ED was sharing with us it is internal and it's also external stigma uh, which later sprouts out to quite a, a huge dilemma out there my name is Sandra. Thank you so much. Keep watching UBC. In a few minutes, you're going to be having more updates coming your way, current affairs um, regarding what has made 
headlines in our news tonight. And Kija Nangoma will be giving you the latest as far as our news is concerned. We had a wonderful time with our guest for the day. That is Kraish Moviru, the executive director of UYP. Uh, that is UYP, Uganda Young Positives. And he's also, he also represents... Um, uh, on the C uh, CCM, he represents the communities on the global on the global fund board in Uganda. That is a topic of discussion. Don't have to wait uh, for first December uh, to embrace as far as that topic is concerned. But you need to do now each and every single time as we recover, we slowly recover from the the pandemic that has really st that struck so many of us and as far as our sectors of the economy are concerned. God bless you. Have a wonderful night and keep watching UBC. It's been a pleasure having your company. Thank you. Since the COVID is, you Thank know, you very, we very have much. to do that. And uh, we hope to continue working together. We've been